We're having the uh, book launch celebration of Two Lives with author Reeve Lindbergh. Best-selling author Chris Bojalian calls Two Lives a beautiful essay collection, funny and wry some moments, wistful and wise at others. Lindbergh may be the daughter of two gifted aviators, but she soars in her own right. This book is insightful, astute, and best of all, honest. And I have to say, I found this review completely accurate. Um, as I was reading, I noticed the book is um, about musings on birth and death, which can both be uplifting, Reed tells us, um, to aging and wondering what happened to her eyelashes. Well, these, these essays are both poignant and funny. And I'll share a favorite passage I have about the aforementioned uh, eyelashes. I was actually pretty worried about the loss of my eyelashes. How could I have lost my eyelashes? Eyeglasses, yes. I lose those all the time. Same here. But eyelashes, how and where was I going to find those? Well, guess what? I did find them. They were on my chin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to spoil that. <laughs> it's completely true. If I'm being honest, I can totally relate. Um, so I urge you to pick up your copy of Two Lives. We have it here tonight at the front counter. If you haven't picked up your copy already, Reeves will be able to sign books after the talk. Um, tonight's reading and talk will be about an hour with time for Q&A, and we do have some refreshments. Please help yourself. Um, and I'd like to remind everybody to please mute or turn off your cell phones and to let you know that the front door is now locked and it will remain locked just for the reading and it will reopen once the reading is done. We do have a back door. If you need to exit during the reading, please use the back door. And we do have a bathroom located at the back of the store. Go to the back door and turn right. I'd like to thank the Vermont Arts Council for featuring tonight's event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. Feel free to pick up a Vermont art sticker there at the front counter. I'd also like to thank Orca Media. They are here filming tonight's event. And if you're interested in seeing this video or other videos or in learning about future events at Bear Pond Books, I'd like to encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. I'm going to pass this around, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. And if you already get it, you just pass it, right? Yes, thank you. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Bear Pond Books. Um, our next book launch event is with hometown lawyer Bernie Lambeck. He's actually right over there in the blue section. <laughs> We're excited to host him for his debut novel, Uncivil Liberties. It's a legal mystery set right here in Montpelier. And he will be here June 5th with desserts catered by Down Home Kitchen. So please mark your calendars for that for June 5th. Tonight we are proud to present Reeve Lindbergh, daughter of aviator authors Charles A. and Anne Marv Lindbergh. Reeve was born in 1945 and grew up in Connecticut. After graduating from Radcliffe College in 1968, she moved to Vermont, where she lives on an old farm near St. Johnsbury with her husband, writer Nat Tripp. Reeve is the author of more than two dozen books for children and adults. Her work has also appeared in magazines and periodicals, including the New York Times Book Review, The New Yorker, and The Washington Post. She is an active board member of the Vermont Arts Council and is active with libraries and other nonprofit organizations in Vermont and nationally. And we're so thrilled to have her. Please help me welcome her. <laughs> I'm not going to talk for an hour. <laughs> but what I thought I would do is read to you from this, this book, Two Lives. And the title was actually uh, suggested by my publisher, Neil Rafel, uh, and his wife, Janice Ray, and their daughter, Adrian Rafel, who is my editor. His family runs a, um, oh, has a publishing, small publishing company called Brigantine Media in St. Johnsbury. Hmm. And I love them. They are, it's a treat to have your 28-year-old editor very, very gently suggest changes or, you know, restructuring here or there. And, uh, you know, and then, to, then to have a book signing at the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum with local beer. It's just <laughs> really nice. And uh, I've, I've loved it. So I, I'm uh, very grateful to Brigantine Media and to Janice and Neil and Adrian and they have a son Ben but he's he's uh, he's in business he doesn't he doesn't do this book stuff so much <laughs> but uh, and I'm I'm 
thrilled to be working right here and visiting store, bookstores all over Vermont, especially this one. This has always been one of my one of my favorites, and I'm delighted to be here. So I'm going to read you a little bit. I'll, I'll read you a little bit from the from the title essay, which is Two Lives. And uh, because of this essay and kind of some of the themes of the others, uh, Neil Rafel, my, my publisher editor, said, you know, this really book really is about two lives. That's what you're what you're talking about. And I thought, oh, I guess he's <laughs> right. And I think that's what I always write about, no matter unless I'm unless I'm writing the children's books, which are rhyming and just crazy and fun or more serious sometimes. But uh, that's a whole different world for me. The children's books, uh, another life. <laughs> but the these books, the more memoirish books, tend to deal with what's happening right now in my life and then what has happened in my family history. And it all kind of seems to be separate and then I realize over time that it isn't. You, know, you can't really completely do that. Your, your lives, whatever they are, however separate they may seem to be, eventually they kind of come together. I think. So here we go. I often think I live two lives, one in the foreground and the other in the background, each life taking its turn. I have a real or normal life in the country where my husband and I live on an old farm at the end of a dirt road. We wear comfortable clothes, write books, raise sheep and chickens, are active in community life and welcome our children and grandchildren whenever they come to visit. There's also an entirely different Lindbergh life which requires putting on somewhat less comfortable clothes <laughs> and traveling to places away from the farm where I attend meetings and give talks and where there are no chickens except for the kind on the menu followed by words like Gordon Bleu and a la King and Kiev. In the second life, I stand up in front of groups of people and talk a little about the books I've written for children and adults and a lot about the lives of my late parents, Charles A. and Anne Mara Lindbergh. I've spoken about my parents on college campuses and Air Force bases, in museums and libraries and schools, to children and to adults around the country for many decades. When I finished with the meetings or the talks, I come home to Vermont, change clothes, and emerge from the limbo of travel and from my Lindbergh life. I settle down with my husband, the dogs, the sheep, and the chickens, immersing myself in farm and community until the next time when I put on my other wardrobe again and out I go. Maybe it's a strange way to live, coming and going and switching focus completely between one life and the other, moving from the present to the past, not even my own past, but my parents, and back again. Still, I've done this for so long that it feels like just another, another part of my routine, like going to the farmer's market or taking one of the dogs to the vet. One of the chief differences is that in my Lindbergh life, there are different questions to answer. Instead of, how long has she been limping? Or, do you want a bag for those? It's, what's your favorite memory of your father? Or, did your mother teach you to write? Or, what can you tell us about the Lindbergh kidnapping? Or, did your father really have other families? These questions are now so familiar that they don't trouble me much, though I can remember when some of them did. I first began to live two lives not long after my father's death in 1974. Before that, my father and my mother spoke for themselves, if they chose to speak at all. Most of their communication with the world was done in writing. Between the two of them, <coughs> they published more than 20 books about their lives and reflections over the years. My father rarely spoke in public during my childhood in the late 40s and 50s, though he had done so before I was born. He made speeches on behalf of the future of aviation after his 1927 flight from New York to Paris when he was in his mid-twenties. He spoke out against America's entrance into the Second World War as part of the controversial isolationist movement when he was in his late thirties. And toward the end of his life, when he was in his sixties, and I in my late teens and twenties, he began to speak out again. This time, he talked about his growing concern for the environment worldwide and his conviction that we must achieve balance between the rapid development of technology and the preservation of nature. I knew him best during this time, his conservation years, when his focus was absolute 
as it had always been absolute on whatever project or passion engaged him. He talked fervently about his efforts to save the monkey-eating eagle in the Philippines, the blue whale in Japan, and the wildlife of East Africa. He was so electrically energetic that even when he was away, his influence remained and reverberated throughout the house. My mother was a different story entirely. During my childhood, our father was present even in his absence. His energy, his rules, his discipline lingering in the house as did the woodsy outdoor scent of his winter jacket in the hall closet. Our mother, however, had the, the ability to be absent within her presence. She was completely with me, especially when I needed her. She listened to my stories, took my physical and emotional complaints seriously, and didn't disappear into the world for weeks or months the way our father did. Still, she could go deeply into our, herself when I was sitting right there next to her. Her eyes would look off and away through the window over the mudflats and marsh grasses of Long Island Sound, one hand fingering a brooch at her neck. I remember it as a cameo in a silver frame with a bouquet of flowers against a black background, all fashioned of tiny, colorful, semi-precious stones. I knew that she was still there with me, but that she was also somewhere else. And that's all I'm going to read of that for now, because I want to read a little of a chapter called Chicken Yoga, Rooster Soup. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. We have kept chickens for over 40 years. Not the same chickens for the whole time, though it sometimes seems that way. There's always a bad hen, ill-tempered and ready to strike, and strike hard, should you try to sneak a hand beneath her feathery breast and extract an egg from the nesting box where she huddles. There's always at least one swaggering macho rooster. There are always a few ditzy pullets hiding in the barn rafters when it's time to come in at night. And there's always one gawky, half-grown chick that turns out to be the prettiest hen in the whole flock. That's the way it is with chickens. To everything, there is a season. And in every season in my life, at least, there are chickens. We've raised chickens for so long that we've seen it all, or maybe I should say we've seen most of it. There may be some surprises <laughs> yet in store, because again, that's the way it is with chickens, surprising. Some of the surprises have to do with eggs. Eggs are the reason we have chickens in the first place. I don't care what anybody says, store-bought eggs don't taste as good as fresh laid farm eggs ever. Sometimes we get bountiful quantities, clutches of rich brown or bright white or even bluish green eggs. Those are from the Araucanas. Sitting quietly in the nesting boxes for me to gather and place in the egg collecting basket I carry with me for this purpose. Sometimes the eggs are warm and clean, just waiting for my hand to curl around them, pick them up, and take them away. Sometimes they are lightly speckled and blotched with brown spots, which may or may not be part of the egg's natural coloring. <laughs> if not, they need cleaning off with a wet paper towel before they're put away in the egg cartons in the refrigerator, but that's easy enough. But there are other times. The hens go on strike for extended periods. They just don't lay any eggs at all. Some people tell me this happens because our hens are old, and some of them certainly are. I don't like getting rid of hens, so we have, we have hens that are, you know, 10, 12, they're just, and they're so nice. I just can't, I just, I don't like this business, this sort of strangling and putting in the pot stuff. So they're just there, and this winter, we had, when we had that terribly cold spell, and one day, a hen dropped dead, and the next day a rooster dropped dead, and I was heartbroken. And my husband said, Reef, do you remember when we got that, that hen? <laughs> and that one of them was 10, and one of them was 11, and it was, you know, 10 below zero. And they, they were done. So um, I don't think you're supposed to keep them that long, but we always do. <laughs> anyway, some people tell, tell our hens are old. Other people tell me our hens don't get enough light in the winter months, and that we should keep a light bulb burning in the barn. We would do this, except that Nat, my husband, the spoil sport, doesn't want to burn the barn down. <laughs> there are also people who advise us to feed the hens something other than just playing layer pellets from the grain store. Layer eggs more frequently pellets? <laughs> I tend to believe 
of all the advice I'm given, so I start to think about doing something different with the hens, but just when I'm about to do it, they all start laying eggs again. <laughs> they lay eggs in the nesting boxes, and they lay eggs on the chicken room floor, and they lay eggs in hidden places in the hayloft, and that's a real problem. When you're stacking hay bales in the barn in July, the last thing you want to have underfoot is a rotten egg from last year, <laughs> unless it's a screeching hen who thinks you're a home invader. <laughs> and I go on at some length, to, and then there is a, a couple we knew who have since moved away, but who live in town um, in St. Johnsbury, and they had several chickens themselves, very beautiful, and they did not travel with them. <laughs> so they would, um, I mean, they were just beautifully cared for and kept, and they were just pretty, pretty hens. And the, um, their, the last, these people's last name was Wales, W-A-L-B-S. And we call these hens the princesses of Wales. <laughs> and they would come and visit us. And they also went to um, a yoga class that, that, uh, in, their own, in their house, a yoga class they had in their house. So the, this hen would come parading around through, throughout the yoga class and you know, doing the lasanas or something. But the, uh, when, when they came to us, it was, uh, the roosters were not polite. Lovely, lovely hens. I think we just kind of put them. We put them in, and kind of close our eyes, and, and hope for the best. And when Tom and him, the Waleses came back home and picked up their beautiful princesses and took them back to their house, and I would ask Tom what how the hens were, how the chickens were. I'm worried. I thought they they had been molested and marauded by our roosters, and he said, "Well, you know, they seem a little depressed." <laughs> uh, gee, you know, it's been a week, and he hasn't called, and he hasn't written. <laughs> so that's, we just, I just go on and on and on about, about my chickens at, at great length. And there was something else I was writing about that I will, you know, Samantha has already, she's already taken away the punchline of my, my eyelashes, but I'm just going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to read a little. It's all right. Where did my eyelashes go? Didn't I have eyelashes? I mean, more than just a few sparsely scattered. They've always been up there, haven't they? They used to be attached to my eyelids in some quantity, with enough, enough thickness available to pull on when I got a speck of dust in my eye in that special way of pulling when I was taught as a child. You grab the lashes between thumb and forefinger and pull the eyelids out and over onto the top of the cheek and then let it go and the speck usually was gone. The other day I had something in my eye and I tried that eyelash pulling remedy, but it was really hard because the eyelashes themselves were gone. <laughs> it was as if somebody had come along and pruned them like little carrot seedlings in the vegetable garden, taking every other plant. Prune eyelashes. <coughs> but I need them, I thought. I need them to protect me from the specks of dust and pet hairs and bits of grit and sand that are kicked up to eye level by wheels or feet or paws moving quickly in my vicinity. I also have the feeling they come in handy when I'm blinking. I did quite a lot of blinking after undergoing brain surgery. It was benign, but I had a tumor. A few years ago, though I don't blink quite so often now, besides I'm used to having eyelashes, though I suppose I've never done much for them or with them. I'm not an eyelash batter, and it's been many years since I used mascara and eyeliner, mostly because I never really got the hang of it, and always ended up looking less like the wide-eyed beauty featured on the eye makeup ads and more like a startled baby raccoon. <laughs> I was actually pretty worried about the loss of my eyelashes. How could I have lost my eyelashes? Eyeglasses, yes, I lose those all the time, but I keep several pairs, and when I lose them, I usually find them again pretty soon. But eyelashes, how and where was I going to find those? Well, guess what? I did find them. <laughs> they were on my chin. <laughs> I have, there's more. <laughs> oh, my. And this was one about my grandmother and her garden, about gardens, called gladiolus. My grandmother had a flower garden, so did my mother and my aunt, and sometimes my sister did too, though she lived in cities for most of her adult life and had limited garden opportunities. 
As I work in my own garden each summer with dirt and plants and garden tools all around me, I can't help thinking about other women in my family and other gardens. I can still see the sloping border of perennials at my grandmother's house in Maine, a cascade of multicolored blooms in tall waving spires and low blossoming clusters, pink and blue and yellow and red and lavender, running along both sides of the grassy path that led from her house down to a beach of rocks and barnacles. <coughs> the only flower from that garden whose name stuck with me at the time was snapdragon, because I never understood how it snapped. If I plucked one flower from its stalk of pale pink or blue or yellow blooms and put my thumb and my forefinger into an upper and lower part of that flower and moved my fingers up and down, I could see the resemblance to a dainty, tiny, pastel finger puppet of a dragon, but it seemed far too well-bred to snap. <laughs> my grandmother was like the snap dragon, a small, energetic, warm-hearted woman with very good manners, but when you looked more closely, she had the strong will of a much more imposing creature. She also seemed to me, even at the age when I knew her, to love parties. Her <laughs> gardens were like elaborate, formal parties, well-conceived, well-staffed horticultural galas. My grandmother employed gardeners, with everybody invited except the weeds. <laughs> My grandmother chose to have 150 gladiolas planted in her main garden. I know this because my cousin showed me an old garden booklet with everything that they had ordered at that time. And I can't even believe the numbers of plants that they, that they brought in from the, the, uh, the nursery in, in uh, Camden, Maine, I believe it was. But that was very confusing for me because I've always heard that my grandmother and her two sisters and Annie and Aunt Edith disliked gladiolas, disliked them so much that they made a pact. When one of the sisters died, the survivor or survivors would see to it that there were no gladiolas at the funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Aunt Edith, the youngest and last of the sisters to survive, took this obligation so much to heart that at my grandmother's funeral, Edith went around the church ripping gladiolas <laughs> from all of the floral. <laughs> we have a few, just a few, gladiolas, or have had. And um, I was very glad to have them because the winters were so long. So I see them as fiery, not funereal. And if the gladiolus display is a little gaudy, well, as my husband said, we can use a little gaudy in this climate. <laughs> it seems outrageous that any flower so exotically colorful could bloom here in northern Vermont. I'm grateful to the gladiolus because they do. I have a little, a little piece about mud season. <laughs> Just a little piece about it. After a long winter at the end of March or in early April, I forget that spring is inevitable. It really will come. I'm impatient, and I wish I could do something to make it come now. I remember the feeling as a child growing up in Connecticut when spring came a month earlier than it does here in Vermont. Still, it never came soon enough. And one year, I went around outside my home with warm water in a pitcher, um, possibly the same water pitcher I now have in my kitchen with the words Allegheny Metalware engraved on its base. I don't know what metal it's made of. Not silver, not pewter, maybe steel. There was a steeliness to the 1950s, as I remember it. Railroad tracks, the braces on my teeth, the color of my father's hair, the glint in his eye when he had something serious to say to me or anyone else in the family. So I walked around the house with a possibly steel pitcher full of warm water, and I poured the water on stubbornly wintry things. Icy spears of grass along the front path, frozen mud puddles in the driveway. I wanted to do my bit to break the grip of winter on New England. I wanted to thaw the whole world. And I go on to what happens when it thaws, and suddenly you don't have a beautiful lawn. What you have is a whole bare area quite a lot of dog poop. <laughs> but I uh, talk about raking and how good it feels to rake, even though I'm, I, I never can believe that having raked the, raked the lawn off the 
my minor perennial beds having raked and raked in the fall. I don't understand why I have to do it again in the spring. Right. <laughs> all those leaves that I raked away, and they're back. So that's what I've been doing just lately. My mother used to talk about the need for human beings to affirm what she called the ongoingness of life, to find a way to move along with change and become part of it season after season, year after year, even during times of great trouble. The need to celebrate the arrival of a new baby, for example, the very month that a beloved family member has just died. I understood this when I first glimpsed my younger daughter after her birth in early January, six months after my father's death. I saw that she had a dimple in her chin like my father's, tiny, intensely blue-eyed, stunned as I was by the enormity of her own birth. Her view of the world not yet focused with recognition of anything I knew, still she had his dimple. Family recognitions and confusions are not uncommon at such moments. So gardens for me and renewal and you know, death and rebirth and all of that gets very, very deeply connected through my living here. And that, that I think has, is true for all of us. That has, it doesn't have to do with living two lives, that has to do with just living our human lives. But in connection with what I call my two lives. I have an essay called Seeing the Airplanes. And it starts, my mother never flew in the spirit of St. Louis. This always seemed odd to me, although I knew that my father's most famous aircraft was built to hold just one person, the pilot, and there wasn't much room to spare inside the cockpit. The idea was to carry enough fuel for the 1927 flight from New York to Paris with a little to spare and to save weight in every other way. Some people called the spirit a flying gas tank because that's pretty much what it was. It certainly wasn't designed to carry passengers. Still, in the flight log my father kept for the spirit, a number of people are listed as having flown with him in that plane, one at a time, and usually for no longer than 10 or 15 minutes, 20 at longest, having looked into the very compact cockpit where my father, six feet two inches, must have felt confined already. I've always wondered where he put these people. On his lap? <laughs> and how hard was it to fly the plane with somebody else in there with him? According to aviation legend, the spirit of St. Louis was not an easy plane to fly with or without passengers. I once heard a story about the creation of the flying replica of the spirit in the 1950s, for the film in which Jimmy Stewart played my father. Apparently, the people who built the replica had followed the original specifications very carefully and believed that they had successfully copied the airplane. However, when their plane was finished and it was time for the first test flights, something seemed terribly wrong. The replica was unstable in the air, the test pilot reported. It shook and shuddered constantly. If the pilot allowed his attention to stray for even an instant, the spirit would stray off course. What had they missed? While those responsible for construction were still pondering this, my father visited the set. He wanted to see the flying replica. In fact, he hoped to fly it. After a certain amount of discussion and concern and maybe even a little panic, the decision was made to let him fly the replica. After all, he knew a thing or two about the original. Maybe he could figure out how to correct the mistakes made in building this one. He took off in the replica while a group of anxious people waited on the ground below. He was gone for five minutes, then he was gone for 10 minutes. The people on the ground expected at any moment to see him bring the plane down, upset and disappointed. But he was gone for a long time before he finally brought the little plane in to land. Everyone waited anxiously to hear his thoughts. And when he emerged from the cockpit, he exclaimed, I had forgotten what a wonderful little plane that is. <laughs> and then, and you got it. You got it perfectly in every detail. <laughs> and that really was the point of that airplane. I think it had to, it had to carry all this f fuel. It had to be unstable in order to keep them awake. I think that was part of it. I mean, they didn't build in the instability, but that was, it was helpful, I believe. 
you know, after and after he flew to Paris, then he went did a tour around the United States. He was in Springfield, Vermont, and they still have a film that I saw when I went to do a reading in the children's room. They, they showed me this film of, of my father landing in, in Springfield in 1927. And all the, all the dignitaries were wearing three-piece suits and hats, and it was, it was in the middle of August. Mm -hmm. couldn't, couldn't, even in Vermont, you don't want to be dressed like that in the middle of August. <laughs> there they all were. And then he went, um, after going around the U.S., he went to Mexico and met my mother. But when he, um, when he was flying to Mexico, he followed his usual practice, because of course they didn't have airports. He, he, would, um, he would fly low over the, um, over the town, over a railroad, sta railroad station, and he would look for the name of the town, and then he would figure out figure out where he was going to go to the next town and fly low over that railroad station and see the name of the town, then he could pretty much be sure he was on the right track. But when he crossed the border into Mexico in order to confirm his route, it seemed reasonable to fly low over a railroad station. And when he looked for the name of a town, he saw this word, Caballeros. <laughs> so he checked the road map for the location. He could not find any town called Caballeros. <laughs> he flew to the next town, found the railroad station, and discovered another sign, Caballeros. <laughs> he flew over three Mexican towns before he realized that Caballeros meant men's room. <laughs> and then he made his way to Mexico City, where he met my mother's father, who was then the ambassador to Mexico, and the children of the family, my mother and her two sisters and her brother. And that became, became the, the moment that my parents met and he took her flying when she went back to Smith College and he went and uh, took her flying in, I guess, it must have been 1928. Oh. Uh, and then they were engaged and married a few months later and then he taught her to fly and she went over the all the air routes, they helped to track, they tracked the earliest air routes for the aviation in industry. They went over the pole to Asia, and she wrote about all this. And um, that went on for, for several years until after, after the death of the, my parents' first child, and then the births fairly quickly thereafter of the rest of the children. And she did not then she stopped flying. He never did, but she stopped, stopped flying. Um, I found that during their lifetimes, I didn't often visit the artifacts, the aircraft, and so on, once or twice in the Aviation Museum, in the National Air and Space Museum. But I became, in recent years, I've really gotten to love visiting. I've been asked to visit and talk a little bit about them. But I love visiting the airplanes where they used to be these kind of metallic bits of history, and I didn't like it because they weren't part of my life. They were, they were from an earlier period of their lives. I've gotten so I just love them. They're like from members of the family. And when I go, I'll find, you know, look through the cases and, and see what kinds of instruments they use and what food they were eating. And there's somebody who found a little bit of some pressed flowers that my mother had found in, in Greenland, I think. And to see that material, rather than pulling them away from me kind of brings them back, which is, uh, which is a, a delight. I, I love doing that. And I realize that as you, you, know, as you get older, you're, um, all the different parts of your life, the history, the parents, the children, the, um, the pieces of, of life kind of pull in together and become part of the same thing. And I love that. And I guess that's why I wrote this book. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. So I don't know if you have questions or comments or thoughts to share. Whatever, whatever you like. When I was reading to, to kids and I would say, do you have any questions? And sometimes somebody would raise his hand and say, my dad just got a new truck. <laughs> 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 it was really fun. <laughs> really related, but um, I recently rewatched a movie called Along Came a Spider, 
oh. in which um, it's about James Patterson's book uh, character Alex Cross. Huh. Morgan Freeman plays the title character. Uh -huh. And um, it's about the Charles Lindbergh story, um, but the, it's a parody. Um, there's a, a guy who likes the story so much that he wants to um, repeat or imitate that crime. Ah, well, the, the, the kidnapping the story. The kidnapping story. Okay. Um, anyway, I recently rewatched it. And I was wondering if uh, you or your family were ever asked to be a part of that Along came a spider. We've been asked to be part. I don't think I've been asked to be part of that. I've been asked to be interviewed for many um, documentaries or mm -hmm. um, show any whatever comes along. If there's something new that somebody finds or thinks they found about the kidnapping, uh -huh. we generally get asked, and we don't we don't get involved. We, you know, we right. I w none of us were born at mm -hmm. that time, and right. so all the only thing we've got is what everybody else has. So the, the researchers are going to do a lot better right. job. Than, I just than meant in care. terms of like if they had asked you, do you want to come to the set? Do you want? Because there was a lot Not about that Charles one. Lindbergh no. that was no, in that of course movie. There was. Yeah. A lot. No, so I didn't know if that was something that. You know, I don't. I'm pretty sure I wasn't. They just asked did it. You know. Tell me again, who was the producer? Well, I don't know, just but like, um, it wasn't. I mean, it was a 1990. Yeah, or so film. I, it may have it, that may it may have been one, but I was maybe asked about. 1997, 98, 99, yeah. around there. I mean, I'm it was, not sure, but I wouldn't. Be, I, it's po very possible. It was possible. the second movie in the Morgan Freeman series because he did. I would have remembered if, yeah. if it were Morgan Freeman. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> well, anything else? Yes. I yeah. That. Yeah. Well, I just wondered if you may, maybe had you know met him. That would be no, cool. That would be wonderful. You know. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so your parents sorry. never talked about uh, kidnapping. Oh no! I mean, they they they, they did if um, well, I can tell you once, but but uh, my mother talked about the death of her child when my I had a little boy who died, and it happened at her house actually. He had been ill and he just died in the night, and she was wonderful, and then talked to me about what what it was like for her and how and how you and she said you now you sort of die a little bit and then you are reborn again. And um, it was very, she was extraordinarily helpful to me. But she, they didn't talk about it um, with us at all. Of course, they didn't talk about, he didn't talk about the flight either. Mm -hmm. there, I mean, the things that were in the past stayed in the past, and they talked about now. Mm -hmm. Or they might talk, he might have talked about his, his Swedish ancestors on the frontier <laughs> in Minnesota, which was then a frontier. Or um, she would talk about her. Her grandmother that I had never met, and that was fascinating. But they didn't talk about the um, sort of Lindbergh phenomenon. They, that that was mm -hmm. not of interest to them in talking about uh, talking with us. So those kinds of things we found out for ourselves, mm -hmm. sort of from the outside, just the way everybody else does. And that's how you found out about the other families. Mm -hmm. Oh, the other families it was different. I had I had a, a, a letter from one of the families in Germany. Mm -hmm. Who did not want the story to get out, and his cousin, the half sister of his, had, had there were three families. One of them, their mother had died, and they wanted to to kind of open up the story to the world. Um, there were two two others absolutely did not want this. There, they were. These were three German women. My my father met two of them were sisters. This was just after the war. They had all had that had family situations that had been devastated by the war. And he became involved with these three women, and um, there were seven children altogether. This was between 19, mid 50s to, to the time he died in, in uh, 1974. And we didn't, you know, we didn't know a thing about it. I don't think my mother did. I, I, the, one of my aunts said, well, she knew something, but she didn't know what she knew. Uh, and. Um, it was not until after she died that, that they approached us, or things began to come out. And I went to Europe and met them all, liked them very much. <laughs> um, and then it kind of calmed down. I think they, they wrote a book, or the family that wanted to write a book wrote a book, and the others just, I don't think they are all connected, which is sad, because they all grew up together. But the, um, the family that I, people that I, st I know 
uh, best are two brothers who now live in Switzerland, and they I'm still quite quite connected and, and very um, very fond of them. Um, I like them all, and I, I, I people say, well, what would you ask your father if you could? And I, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> but these are real people, and they're just lovely. And I, li I met one of the mothers and liked her so much. So I kept thinking, these are, these are like friends of my mother's. <laughs> these are very well educated and quite artistic and um, quite gentle people. And I, I don't want to make a big sensational story about them. I just like them. And I thought, well. In your book, um, I'm, I'm going to let well, just because she raised her hand. <laughs> no, it's because she just asked earlier. She was like, I don't have a new car. <laughs> oh, you don't have a new truck? No. Uh, do any of your, you or any of your siblings, uh, are are aviators? None of my siblings. I mean, I think we were all taken to fly, and uh, my two older brothers, I think, learned most. But I have a nephew. My oldest brother's son, Eric Lindbergh, who is, who is very much an aviator, and if you look him up, it's E-R-I-K. It, he's involved in all kinds of kind of cutting edge environmental uh, aviation, and uh, he's been he's been flying forever. Uh, wonderful young man. Oh well, gosh, he's got to be 50 by now. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but that that's the one. Eric is very very much an but aviator. None, none of the children. None of the children. No, no, and. You know, I mean, actually, I've got a brother who did a lot with uh, not hang gliders. What am I thinking of? Um, Kitty Hawk flyer. Yeah. What, what, what did you just say? Kitty Hawk flyer. Paraglider. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's uh, well, he, he's going over the canopy of the jungle with these. With these yeah. Oh. Frankly, they're not gliders though. But anyway, he's so he was he's been somewhat involved, but not in not as a profession at all. And our father actually did not encourage it. He said, "This is it." He said, "You want to find something that is as as exciting and innovative and adventurous as aviation was for me." He said, "It's different. It's a different world now." So he wasn't. Well, he wasn't. He wanted us to experience it. So he did take every take us all flying, and the older ones got to do more than I did because uh, I was kind of little at the time. And he, uh, he had me. Um, I mean, I did have to kind of use the stick and. With the aircraft this way and that way and you know, forward and back and it was it was kind of fun but I couldn't really reach <laughs> and, and he and I I had the one um, I was the one person aside from his own father with whom he had a forced landing because the, we were in a um, an Aranka a little air, aircraft and we were flying out of Connecticut and the engine cut out and there was an automatic choke supposedly but it wasn't working so we had to land in a cow pasture. And he had, he said, you put your head down and put your hand, arms like that, and I did, and it kind of went bumpity bump, bump, bump. And we landed, and then they, they couldn't get the, you know, of course, nobody could fly it out. They had to take the plane apart to get it out. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, it was fun. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, that's okay. In, in your book, uh, Under, Under a Wing. Under a Wing. Yeah. Uh, at, at the, toward, the, toward the end, you mentioned when um, your mom had, which it was so difficult to imagine, had had dementia. Yeah. And yeah. you were at a, fam a family gathering, and probably one of the great grandchildren uh, serving ice cream or something. Your mom had the idea that the ice cream was poisonous or something. Oh yeah. And it took, my it son. took it took it away. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, wow, here is this woman who oh, was so articulate and so such a keen mind. And this child would only remember her as this person who well, took away the ice cream. Didn't. There were other, there were other, uh, there were other times, and, uh, but that was it was hard for him. He was young, he was quite young then, and when that was, he was going through all that. But he also had times when he would, he would just be there, and she would be quiet, and it was so it wasn't entirely bad. But that was hard. That was so he hard. had a lot of other memories of her. Then. I don't know, yeah. but I, but I know there were other times. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if, I mean, if you asked him, he might say. Oh, you know, she took away the ice cream, but there were there were other other periods, and he's a pretty he's a pretty thoughtful guy. Now, sweet one, and uh, it would be interesting to ask. But but she lived with us and was around, and and so they, you know, they saw each other quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But there were things like that. Yeah. I have I wrote actually I didn't write a book I kept a journal and my editor was interested in it and there was a book published called No More Words about that period. Mm -hmm. Uh, she didn't speak much. Then mm -hmm. you never knew, if she did, you never knew 
what it was going to be. So I had a somewhere in that book a wrote about driving her from I was we were going from St. Johnsbury to Littleton and oh, over that really beautiful highway. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I was whizzing along and thinking this and that and my mother who never didn't speak but liked to be driven places, she suddenly said, I'm afraid. And I said I asked her, I was kind of, thinking about her condition and you know, sort of, what is it? Is it losing friends or feeling feeling older and not able to do and was it this, was it that? And she looked at me and she said, It's your driving. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just, you know, you, you make it you have this drama in your head. And there's something quite practical going on or impractical, who knows? Were you closest to your mother? I don't. I don't. We all think we were closest to my mother, <laughs> but I, I was there at, um, at a. I think I was. I was there at a, at a period where I, I felt very close to her because you know everybody else had grown and gone, and, and um, I was probably around at a part a time in her life when uh, when the others weren't. How close do you uh, think Jimmy Stewart claimed to uh, portraying your father? I think he was. Quite a bit like my father, as a, as a, I mean, he was in his fifties when he when he played my father at twenty five, and he did have a they, they were similar. I mean, I think there was a, a quality of kind of I don't know American lanky, uh, somewhat reticent personality that that they shared. It, I guess he really wanted to play that role, so it was uh, it it resonated. It, he wasn't. He wasn't a kid when he did that. But um, did they ask your advice or anybody in the family? They about it? Didn't but they? I think my father met him and liked him, and thought it was just fine. I mean, he, he wasn't didn't get too much involved in the. Um, once in a while, he uh, got involved. I think they had. There was a fly. I don't know if you know the movie. There's a fly that is in the cockpit and it buzzes around and it. That's right, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. my father wasn't crazy about the fly, but, <laughs> but then somebody got really carried away with it and he wanted, my, he wanted the fly, they wanted the fly to wake him up at a critical moment and my father swats the fly and the fly dies and he puts him out the window and he said, no. <laughs> so they just have the fly flying around them. That's as much as he, he was able to stop them from burial at sea. For the <laughs> <laughs> it gets, it does get silly sometimes. You know, sometimes you just say, "What?" <laughs> and, it's, and it's just as often me being silly as anybody else. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. All the way. Oh, way over! I'm so sorry. I was just wondering what your favorite music was and is. What what music do you remember from when you were younger and part of the family music. growing? And what is music? For you now? Oh my. Well, my mother loved Bach, so I probably would, would go for that anytime, anytime I hear it. Um, there was a lot of music, um, but it was all hers. You know, she was, I mean, he would, he liked it, but he, uh, he what about you? What music do you like? <laughs> just a, most, I like everything. I, I like, uh, I'm just trying to think. It's not much I don't like, but I, I don't think I have a, um, well, there are a few things I don't like. <laughs> I mean, I'm very, I love classical music, and I like it, and I also like, I love all the traditions. I love that. I think that's pretty great. Um, I can't, I can't think. Is torch songs? Jazz? Uh, Frank songs, Sinatra? Not so Judy much. Garland. Frank Sinatra, not so much. Uh, I think, I think, I stick with classical music. Okay. Of, uh, I like Baroque, and I like I, I love uh, Mozart. I love Mozart, and I like uh, Motown. 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 I love Motown. I've heard that for a while. <laughs> yeah. Did you and your mother have a relationship as fellow writers? Probably. Yeah, I think we did. We would talk about how, about how, you know, what, and my sister as well. You know, what, what different, you know, what it took to write. And, what, and my mother was the one who. Uh, when we were young, would, if you had something you were thinking about and talked to her about it, and it was interesting, and it was something about nature or something about something you were thinking about that was important to you, and she would always say, "Write that down. Just write it down." So that that was a big 
are changing so mm -hmm. and now for instance this particular library here in Montpelier no longer carries the encyclopedia because there's online it's information online. Mm -hmm. uh, that people can get but you know this is, I feel this is a form of discrimination against again the very poor who have no um, computers so then that keeps them from the library what do you see as a solution for that Well, I think the li what the librarians feel, what? the librarians feel that in the library is is all the online material. I mean, there are there are there are at our library at St. Johnsbury, there are banks of computers and people, and you could come in and use them for free, and you can get instruction. As what if well. you don't know how to use the computer? The, there is instruction as well. There are there are people people who will help you learn how to do that. And I think there are also reference books. I don't think they're all gone. But I think it is what's hard is to kind of keep, keep it up, keep them up to date. And there is a sense that there might even be more information now online. I think, I think that's true about the online. What I'm concerned about is the uh, young people in deprived schools where they don't have all these computers. That's really, that's really hard, because they absolutely need them. They absolutely need, need computers to function. Now, mm -hmm. I just I've just had a correspondence with a, a, a archivist actually, one of the archivists at the Air and Space Museum, a historian who was very worried about the absence of papers. She spent her life with mm -hmm. papers mm -hmm. and ca gathering um, the materials uh, of, from a, from a lifetime, which would be would be all um, correspondence, especially and uh, whether it's business or personal. And that there could, there's a great deal of concern that that's gone and and, it is gone, yes, and yes. very difficult to retrieve. So and there are some very important things going on, but I guess we technically, you know, do you Facebook have any suggestions though as to how one like me could could work to to see that these deprived children, because they are deprived, learn the the techniques of using a, a real encyclopedia if they don't have the online access. I'd ask the I'd I'd ask the people who are working with us children what kinds of opportunities there are and and then work work to get those opportunities improved i'd like to know what you know what they've actually got and some of the very small schools i'm amazed at how much access they have but um access to what access to uh, to, to computers. computers there's much more access than than there was even even um you know 30 years ago when you'd have a library, and you'd say, "Well, we can use. We have a computer, and we can use it from. Uh, we can use it from one to three when the person who knows about it comes in." That's not true anymore. There are people are very computer literate in libraries and in schools because they've had to be. Uh, um, <clears throat> but I check it out. I might go go to that to that library, and if somebody tells you we have nothing in our nothing in terms of computer access for our children, that's crazy. They've got to have it. Um, I would just say um, I work with special ed and some of the issues that I see uh, are not that the resources are not available, it's that those families don't know how to get out their front door. Um, whether or not that's apathy, whether or not that's a drug addiction, whether or not that's um, the inability to see beyond their culture. Um, their culture is very embroiled in the system hates us. We hate the system. Uh, that's the that's culture. Other issue, that's the that? mindset. So yeah. it's not necessarily that the resources are not there. They're there. Their mindset is, I don't want your resources. I don't want your library. I'm going to go and I'm going to rip all your books up. Oh, boy. I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, smash in your computer. Uh, that's the mindset. Because uh, the world is the enemy. Um, people who are trying to help you are the enemy. That's, that's the mindset. So 
my work is to help them step out of that mindset of, I'm not your enemy. I am trustworthy. I'm not an adult who's going to hit you, abuse you, punch you. So that's trust, trust, trust has a boundary. Right, yeah. so, so yeah. basically yeah. They're, they're, they're very uh, hurt mm -hmm. people, very hurt. Um, and they come from generations of hurt. And if your parents can't read, and if your parents can't write, their defense is that reading and writing is bad and stupid and dumb. And if you grow up in that household, if you can read and write, your parents might say, you're dumb because you read and write. Why are you reading and writing? You're dumb to do that. So not only do they have an internal pressure against them, they have external pressure, and then their peer group, if they can't read and write, you know, who are you to be smart? Who, who are you? That? But it what, changes. You know, it you know changes. What I mean? So, so, change so that's the, the mindset. The that's the, the mindset, yeah. and then we're trying to, you know, put a growth mindset. One of the children I tutor uh, yeah. comes from a very rural, and, and uh, the, yeah. has a lot of the same kind of association. Right. But, but a very, this child has a very wholesome home life and good conversation at the dinner table and all. But getting back to your issue, she did, uh, when, I brought, uh, when I brought this student down to the Kellogg Library to use the computers, I was amazed at how much he knew, how yeah. much he did yeah. know. Just from this yeah. little rural school, he, it, it was not a, it was not a deprived atmosphere over yeah. there, as even though it didn't have a lot of the bells and whistles in the bigger schools, he mm -hmm. had he knew a tremendous. I was impressed. That's that interesting. Much. So there's deprivation that has to do of spirit that has to do yeah. with yeah. your internal situation, and right. then then there's the the literal deprivation that you're worried about behind that you're worried about yeah. not having not having access. Access to it. Yeah. But you can always always volunteer time, resources, money. Always the schools are always welcome for more people to volunteer, to go to homes, to be a big brother, big sister, a mentor. Um, take that child and get an ice cream cone. Yeah, um, there's a lot of, lot of lots, volunteerism lots, going lots on in Vermont. That we would love yeah. help. <laughs> Do you work through boys and girls? Or? Um, no, I work uh, through Spalding High School. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I just wondered if you have anything you're excited about growing in your garden this spring. Do I have anything excited that, I, that, that I'm growing? Yes, I've found, I've, I've dug down and found a little bit, my, my astilbe is coming up, and it's gonna, I love that stuff. And then, uh, oh, there's something that I think, I thought was a dead Daphne, which I, I was mm. very fond of, but I thought it was, it isn't. <laughs> they are hard to come by. Yeah. Um, I'm listening to you talk and listen and listening to you read your text, and it's. I feel a lot of your talking in general is like writing. Yeah. And so, how do you delineate and gather the pieces that you're going to put in the book? And does your language change a little bit, do you think? I don't. It changes after somebody good has edited it. <laughs> but I, I try not to have a change. I, I would like it to be. I would like it to be the same. The same thing. I don't want to do. And I work. And I do some teaching and um, with writers. And, and uh, you don't have to be a, something called a writer. Mm. You know, if, if if you just if you're talking, sometimes people will talk to me and say these wonderful things, and then they start to put it on paper, and it's oh. It, it becomes more formal, it, it, it becomes a little stilted. I keep thinking, no, just keep talking, but you know, talk on your computer or with your pen or whatever it is. Yeah. Because I think it should be, I think it should always be a conversation for me, mm -hmm. because otherwise I'm getting, you know, fancy schmancy or something that I don't like, or I'm getting didactic, or I, and usually if I do that, I just have to take it all out and start again. So do you write with a pen or on the computer? Both, both. I, I usually start with a pen because that, that I kind of that keeps me going and, it, and I'm not scared of it. <laughs> so, and then I'll start and then I'll work on, on the computer. I cross things out, and rip things up. It's amazing. Yes. You know, it's this. In one of Philip Roth's books, he wrote about. Are you familiar with it? 
You wrote about his about your father. Oh yes. And he fictionalized that your father had become president. Oh yes. And he God claimed that your father was very <laughs> anti-Semitic. Uh, well, I think anybody would. You know, he, he made he made speeches, anti-war speeches pre-war, and my mother said if you write, if he, she read the speeches, said if you if you say that, they will be you will be called anti-Semitic for the rest of your life. He said, but I'm not. And no, I, I mean he your father. Didn't, he didn't. He yeah. didn't. I think understand what that was. I don't think he did. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of residual kind of racism, anti-Semitism still in this country. When we, and we don't mm -hmm. recognize it. He was, he was an object lesson for me because I didn't think he was anti-Semitic or racist. But I look back at some of those, the language and I think, oh, no, you know, this mm -hmm. is not who I knew. I don't understand this. Mm -hmm. um, but it made me very humble about thinking that I was a good guy because who knows? It's, it's, uh, that's tough stuff. Yes, I did not read that book, The Plot Against America. I thought I just can't. I can't it wasn't bear it. his best book, but it wasn't bad. But of course, it wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> He's a really good writer. He's a really good writer. But I just some some of it. I just think I don't think I can stand it, even even though um, you know they they somebody says things and writes things. By golly, that's what they've done. You you can't get away from it. Yeah. Well, of course, most of his writing was about his experience as a Jewish person. So. Of course, and it, and it was, and he, he was also very, you know, he was very good. He was very funny. He was uh, highly impressive. So, yeah. So, and did your father later on sort of acknowledge um, that his positions were misguided? Or no, he never. <laughs> he believed that he was. Um, he believed that it, I mean, he, he fought, you know, he, went, went, he fought as a civilian. He you know, went out in the, in the Pacific and flew combat missions and helped the pilots to economize fuel. And um, he certainly believed in, in serving his country in wartime. But he, he was absolutely an isolationist, America first. Um, and he, 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 I don't think I've ever known him to, um, to say, oh, I was wrong. Mm. I don't think I may I may be wrong about that, but I don't remember him changing. My mother w was much more that way, but that would have been uh, very difficult for him. I think. I don't. I didn't know him as as a, a as a racist, anti-Semitic. I, I didn't. That wasn't how we were raised or any of that. But on the other hand, he wrote what he wrote. Mm -hmm. Said what he said. I did not believe that it was anti-anybody. That's interesting. What uh, are you referring to precisely? Pre-war speeches. And, and my father was, an, was a, an isolationist in the America First movement, which did not wish the US to enter World War II. Okay. And the, um, there was a large percentage of the population mm -hmm. that wanted to stay out of the war for a long time. And that was all over once, once of course, Pearl Harbor. Harbor. Right. But, um, but he was definitely in the vanguard of that movement. Okay. And what was his reasoning? I mean, beyond just we should take care of our country? We I mean, should take care of our country. This yeah. wasn't our war. Right. Um, and that there was something about, and I should know, know this much better than I do, but that um, we would, that Europe would be destroyed and uh, the Russians would come and take over, something like that. But I don't mean to belittle it, because mm. there were some very, very well-respected, mm. intelligent people who, um, who were of this persuasion. Right. When he came to Brewster of Yale, there were a number of people who went on to do all kinds of other things. My father definitely was accused of being in that position because of racist or anti-Semitic feeling, and he claimed that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And yet, some of the things that he that he wrote sounded pretty close. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. But I don't think he knew that. Yeah. I think I might have remembered, but this could be misremembering that aviation was in such an early stage, and that your father, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, had great hopes that aviation would bring people yes. closer, and that it would be a more peaceful world. And yes, it is. Horrendous to him to think that then planes were being used to drop bombs. And Definitely. That was very much what, ha what happened. That was really, I think that brought him into the environmental movement in a, in a funny way. His, his sort of view from the air um, gave him a sense of what we had to lose if we kept on destroying the planet. And that somehow planes 
the fact that we could communicate more quickly would bring people together. And, and you had hope that. Yeah. yeah. Complicated, many faceted mm -hmm. individual. Yeah. Um, were you aware whether he experienced bitterness about his, you know, his sort of reputation as this great American hero mm -hmm. be, being somewhat tarnished by the politics of the time and his views? I think he was he was shocked and um, saddened. I don't think he particularly liked being a big, you know, so so hugely famous. So I don't think that would have been right. the difficulty. I think it was the notion that he was um, anti-American, unpatriotic, mm -hmm. and he almost was not able to serve. And, and of course, he wasn't ser wasn't serving in the Air Force anyway. Not not officially, but he was he was very pleased to be able to fly in the Pacific and that meant a great deal to him. And he was then sort of reinstated uh, officially later on. And and I think that made, meant a great deal to him. But he definitely was, you know, up there and down there and then kind of when his life sort of evened out as best we knew. <laughs> uh, he was um, I think that was a very good time for him, that the, those environmental years. Did he remain uh, an isolationist, so to speak, after Pearl Harbor? Oh, no, he flew in the Pacific. He, jo he joined up. Oh, he, oh he, I see. He, he so he changed his war. mind, essentially. Actually. He, I can't say that he changed his mind, but I can. He, he, I remember him talking to one of my brothers who yeah. refused to serve, and, and we did not serve in the Vietnam War. Left the country, never came back. Mm -hmm. um, and my father argued with him and said, I was against the war, but I served. And I served my country. That was his feeling. It was very cut and dried and, and very, um, mm -hmm. and that's very characteristic of him. My brother said, no, no, this, this you can, I can't do. So, yeah. This isn't necessarily something you would know, but um, my sister is involved in a project uh, where they just declassified women air service pilots, mm -hmm. uh, WASPs. Um, and their role in bringing planes to and from uh, different bases. Yes. Um, and I, I just wouldn't know if you, your father would have crossed, crossed oh, paths. Oh, yes, yes, he knew them. He knew yeah. them, and I knew one. I knew a wonderful, a wonderful woman who was in, and a, a group of, there are still, I mean, there are those who are still with us. There are, they still, there are still those who meet, and they are often honored. Um, that was a remarkable group of women. Right. And, awesome. Uh, they were, uh, of course, they couldn't, they couldn't fly them after they brought them to the men to, to, right. to, to use right. them. Uh, then, if I may ask, um, would I be able to get my sister in touch with you? She interviews women air service pilots, and she's filming a docu-series about them. But you need to find the women. You, I mean, you need right. to find she, those no, women. She, she yeah. has. But I was just wondering if I could also connect her to you. If, if she. I don't think I have much information, but, you know. Here. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. I might be able to refer her to somebody. If I can oh, yeah. Well, I know maybe that. And maybe that. Yes. Yeah. I know I can. Great. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Will you sign my book? I will sign your book. <laughs> <laughs> One question. Did your father know Sarah Fyodor? You know, I'm not sure whether he knew him or not. I should, I could, I probably should, you know, I should look in the Blackbird biography. <laughs> or, and, and he might, he might have met him. I don't know. Because they were sort of these both extraordinary, very similar, yeah. free yeah. men. Yeah. 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 Thor Tyrell was from Europe.